expert here. I gave them your background about you having been a uh, Iran's ambassador to the UN uh, and then had left Iran uh, over disagreements with approaches and policies, have been in the US for decades, have taught at uh, Bennington, at Princeton and other places. So with that, if uh, any and all opening comments, I understand we have about an hour. And then what we can do is move around the room with any Q&A. How does that work for you? That's fine. I will try okay. to speak up to half an hour to 40 minutes and then leave the rest of the time for question and answer. All right. And obviously, uh, this is uh, top of the uh, the people's attention at this point, interest given all the world and global events. Right. So how are we, Rebecca, on the um, the sound? Uh, Rebecca here at the library requests a professor, if you can just speak up a little bit, that would sure. be helpful. A little louder. Thank you. It's all yours. Should I begin? Yes, please, by all means, begin. It's a pleasure to be with you. I hope our conversation can be useful to uh, the audience, and I'm sure I will learn from the questions and comments they uh, raise in our discussion. Let me begin by saying that uh, the birth and evolution of the Iranian revolution over the past 44 years seem to confirm this view that revolutions like earthquakes come as a surprise and defy prediction in the course of their development. I can say that if you read Iranian history for a century before the 1979 revolution, you do not find a single phrase, the slightest suggestion that such a possibility could actually be the reality of Iranian political you know, development. And yet we are faced with it. Let me say a few words, just begin with some very, very brief historical background that as you know, Iran is a very old country, one of the oldest nations in the history of the world. And even though foreign governments, Western governments, Russia, the United States, European governments have had significant influence in Iran over the years. But Iran has never been a colony. The country has always maintained its independence. And until the beginning of the 20th century, the political background of Iran was fundamentally monarchy and an autocratic rule. In other words, nationhood and the idea of people participating in uh, the political life of the society was really unknown, not only in Iran, but in the rest of the countries in the region. But in mid 19th century, a number of Iranians coming from the elite families traveled to Europe and they were the ones who actually began to introduce the idea of nationalism, the idea of democracy, the idea of modern state. And their activities led to the revolution in Iran in 1906, the constitutional revolution. And the purpose of the revolution was to limit the absolute power of the king. That is to say, absolute monarchy was supposed to be a kind of a conditional and a democratic interference and democratic control and so forth. That revolution went from 1906 to 1911. And after that, the chaos in, in the country. In other words, many people who had participated in the revolution and they were really a minority at the time, Iran only had 10 million people. And I would say no more than five to 10% of the people at all participated or identified with the revolutionary idea. And yet they were very much united in opposing absolute monarchy. But it, when it came to alternative, to suggestion, there was a great deal of fragmentation. And as a result of that, the country could never really establish uh, political you know, order, stability, 
And as a result of that, in 1921, there was a military coup. But, but at the time, Reza Khan, who was actually working for a Russian trained uh, military unit, and he began the coup and he tried to establish a, 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 a government that is moving away from monarchy to uh, republicanism. But the, it's very fascinating that the religious people were very much opposed to it because they associated republicanism with what was happening in Turkey under Ataturk, which was very anti religious traditionalism, and also the idea of republicanism in Western Europe or in, in the United States largely was secular, and the religious people at the time were opposed to the idea of secularism. As a result, Reza Khan ended up establishing the Pahlavi monarchy in 1925, and very much he was very much interested in economic, educational, judicial modernization of the country, and he had a great deal of success in this regard with the assistance of Iranian elite who had been educated in European countries, and yet he was a dictator. In other words, he was very much interested in modernization, in uh, particularly in the education, judiciary, economy, and yet he, he continued to be an absolute monarch and at lack of freedom created a great deal of criticism against him. And as time went on, particularly during the 1930s, he seemed to be more attracted to what was happening in Germany and in Turkey. The only country where he visited was Ataturk, visiting Ataturk in Turkey, which was actually a Republican you know, state against uh, the uh, uh, the religious tradition of Turkey, and he was also invited to have close relationship with Germany. So when the World War II began, the European countries and the United States did not trust him because of his close association with Germany. So they expelled him from the country and made his son, who at the time had been educated in Switzerland. And when he became a king, he was only 21 years old. And for during the 1940s, because he did not have power, Iran really enjoyed from 1940 to 1952, Iran enjoyed a genuinely open society in the sense that all political parties were, were free to act. And the idea of nationalism, the idea of modernity gained a great deal of attention and attraction during this period. And the only time in the entire Iranian history that the society really enjoyed uh, civil liberties. And Mohammad Mossadegh, who was a nationalist, a Swiss educated lawyer, he led the nationalist movement. And at that time, Iranian oil was completely controlled by the British. So nationalization of oil became the organizing idea of this nationalist movement, and he actually succeeded. It was the first time that the British economic interest in the region was being significantly challenged, effectively challenged, and the British resisted it. And the opposition to Mossadegh, which was the liberal nationalist prime minister, led to a coup in nine, and during the, when Truman and Atchison were in power. Great Britain tried to influence President Truman and his Secretary of State Atchison to engage in a coup against Mossadegh, the liberal nationalist government. But President Truman and Atchison, who personally knew Mossadegh, they had met in Switzerland during their, uh, when Mossadegh was attending law school there, they refused to do that. But when Eisenhower and the Dulles brothers came to power, they joined Great Britain and they engineered a coup against Mossadegh. And the Shah from then on became a dictator very much like his father, even though he continued to be interested in modernization in the area of economy, education, culture, art, and so forth. 
but there was absolutely no political freedom. Therefore, at that time, there was this sentiment of the, that against the coup and became a very close ally of the United States. The kind of anti-Americanism, anti-Westernism that we witnessed after the revolution, it was born in 1953 following the coup. So the, in other words, there were at that time after the coup, the, the, the freedom of expression came to an end and political repression was expanded. And yet the Shah was very much interested in, in modernity and very close to, to the United States during his entire uh, uh, rule. And several political parties developed during the period. The leftist parties, the national liberal parties, and the religious groups. And here, all of these groups, they were the, the opponents of the Shah during the 1960s and 70s, even though they were very different from each other. The Communist Party of Iran was actually a tool of the Soviet Union. Followers of Mossadegh were very much influenced by Western European liberal nationalism. And the religious people that we will talk about more, they were really more, they were, their opposition to the Shah will have more to do with liberalization or modernization of the social cultural values and personal freedom, particularly with respect to gender equality than with his dependency on the United States or on economic issues. In other words, while the leftists and the liberals were focusing on social justice and democratic values, the liberal, the re religious groups led by the clerics, their, their opposition was fundamentally with advancement of social cultural modernity of the country. And yet what they all had in common, that is these competing different groups, but they had in common was opposition to political autocracy of the Pahlavi dynasty. That was the basis of the revolution. And we really have to understand, and I don't know the audience, the older people on the audience, people to, who, who remember the politics of the 1960s and 70s, particularly the anti-war movement, that anti-Vietnam war movement in the United States and in the Europe, it was very influential. And also the revolution in China, the revolution in the Soviet Union, the revolution in Cuba, very influential among certain intellectuals educated, particularly the leftist groups. In other words, the atmosphere of the time was very different from what we witness today in the world. So when uh, here, the religious people, Ayatollah Khomeini, who had been expelled from uh, the Iran by the Shah because of his, it's very fascinating to say, his main opposition to the Shah was his, uh, because of Shah's giving the right to vote to women, even though there was no free election, but it was symbolically important. And gender equality under the Pahlavi, as well as social, as well as secularization of the judiciary and uh, the educational system of the country. And when he was in, um, it, he, he was expelled to Iraq and Iraq and Iran were actually enemies at the time. Later on in 1975, Iran and Iraq actually made peace. They had border problem. They settled the border differences. And I never forget that later on after the United States invaded Iraq and they brought in a lot of uh, documents from the Iraq and there are actually all of these documents at the Harvard. And I read in an, in an article, which was based on the documents the United States appropriated in Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein, I read a fascinating conversation between the Shah and Saddam Hussein. The Shah calls Saddam Hussein and says, expel Khomeini from Iraq. And as Saddam Hussein tells him, if I expel him from here, you know, he might be actually more of trouble for you. But here he is under my control. The Shah thought expelling Khomeini from Iraq it would humiliate and isolate him. And no country was willing, and he was he was very much opposed to coming to 
the Western countries because he wanted to go to an Islamic country. But nobody Charles was so influential that he didn't give him any, no Islamic country was willing to give him a visa. So he ended up going to France because at the time, the Iranians didn't need visa to go to France and many other European countries. So once he became to, to, came to, to Paris, he became an international figure and he received massive attention and many liberals, many leftists surrounded him, not because they followed him ideologically or in terms of values, but he became the symbolic uh, the leader of this revolution consisting of diverse you know, perspective than diverse socioeconomic in orientation. I never forget at the time the Inquiry magazine, I was teaching in San Francisco, in Sacramento at the time, the Inquiry magazine asked me to go to, to Notre Chateau in Paris to interview him for an article they wanted to publish. I went there, the first thing I told him in, when I interviewed Khomeini in Paris, I introduced myself as a teacher, as a professor. He interrupted me and said, I'm also a teacher, nothing I wish more than returning to Rome, which is a religious city, and uh, theology, uh, uh, theocratic schools are there, and to resume my good. I thought it was music to my ear. I said, well, this man who is actually supporting a, a revolution against autocracy and against dictatorship is not interested in power. And he said that, which later on we learned that it was very systematic deception to introducing himself as someone who is not interested in power. So when he came to Iran and took over the country, finally when the Shah collapsed, here there were four revolutions in the 20th century, Russia, China, Cuba, and Iran. These four revolutions had two fundamental things in common. One was having an uncontested leader, that is an absolute leader in all four of them. It was Stalin and Castro, Mao Zedong and Khomeini. And they had another thing in common, which was really fascinating. And that is really the point that we must understand about the Iranian revolution in order to, to appreciate its uniqueness or suffer from its uniqueness. The other three revolutions in Cuba, in China, they want they claim to create a society that had never existed before. In other words, they were interested in Marx and Marx, the, the fiction, the, uh, the imagination that had created for a classless society, interviewed a lot of people. what happened in reality, it all collapsed, it was meaningless in reality. In Iran, it was different. They wanted to go return to a to return to a state that had existed 1400 years ago. In other words, it was return to the beginning of you know, Islam, that anything that happened in Iran for a century toward secularization, they were very much you know, opposed to it. In other words, the Iranian revolution was not looking forward to create a society that had not existed before, but a society that had existed 1400 years ago. And that society is largely the product of imagination and fiction. It has absolutely nothing to do with historical you know, realities, except one important uh, dimension of that early Islam, which was actually successful in the beginning, they rejected the idea of national boundaries. Islam was supposed to be a universal religion and the purpose of Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad and the political movement from my perspective is started was expansionism. And during his lifetime and shortly after that, it started in a small village and it, it ended up being the second most powerful religion in, in the world. So in other words, the Iranian revolution, which is a fundamentalist revolution, it was anti-indictment, that is fundamentally opposed the ideas of modern social cultural values which began with French and American revolution institutionalized in this country, particularly with this, the idea of gender equality and secularization of judicial and educational system. They tried to move this. In other words, Khomeini automatically openly said, we reject the idea of uh, nationalism. And he used the word omat. Omat in Arabic means Islamic community. So they were very much, they started 
at assisting other Shi'i groups. Remember that Iran is a Shi'i Islamic country. And it's, it's uh, if there is question, I can respond to the differences, but the differences between, let's say, Protestantism and Catholicism, it led to war and violence. The same thing with respect to Shi'ism. But Iran was the only Shi'i, the only country where a majority of the people were Shi'is, and from the very Shi'ism of Islam started in 17th century, and the Safavid dynasty, which was competing with the Ottomans, they used Shi'ism as an ideology to compete with the Ottomans who were Sunnis. And yet they managed to, with respect to socialization and inheritance of religious values and so forth, Iran became a Shi'i country and they decimated the Sunnis even to this day. So Iran began to help the Shi'is in other Arab countries. In other words, beyond the, the, going beyond that, the, that it, it, transnational, transborder uh, involvement, the Shi'is, at the time Iraq had a Shi'i majority, but they, had, they were powerless. Saudi Arabia had about probably no more than 10% of the Shi'is, and again, they were very much marginalized politically. And in many other uh, countries, the, the great help that the Iran received with respect to its expansion of, uh, of uh, Shi'i religion in the region and confrontation with, with the Western world was when President Bush in 2003 decided to invade Iraq. Iran and Iran was the real beneficiary of that invasion, because after that the Shi'is came to power, and today they are in power, and Iran connected with Shi'is, very close relationship, and from there to Syria, which was Shi'is of Syria represent 10% of the population, but they dominate the country, and Iran has been very close to the Assad family in Syria. It, in Syria, when this overwhelming majority of the Sunnis rebelled against the Shi'i government in Syria, it led to civil war, as we remember, it's, it's relative, but from 19, from 2011, it went on and Syria had about 20 million people. As a result of the civil war, 10 million people were uh, left, had to leave, they became uh, and 600,000 people died, and six, 10 million people became refugees, many of them, and even to this day. And Iran played a role. Russians did the bombing, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards used force in order to uh, stabilize Assad government, Bashar Assad government, which really represented a tiny minority and one of the most uh, cruel government on planet in Earth. So here, Iran became a major force in the Middle Eastern countries. And what is important here to note, Iran's opposition to the United States in general, in Western countries in general, and the United States in, in particular, has nothing to do with conventional or economic issues of international risk. It's social cultural. And the reason Iran is becoming more and more close to China and Russia and North Korea, it's because in these countries, there is no discussion of human rights, even though they are not Muslims, but they are not interested, but they, they're totalitarian states, just as you know, Iran is. So we have a revolution that is fundamentally, if I want to use one word to describe the nature of this revolution, which is absolutely unique, in the modern world, I've dis described as an anti-enlightenment revolution, a revolution which is fundamentally opposed to gender equality, to individual freedom, to secularization of education and secularization of life itself. This is really the most important criteria of the Iranian revolution. And the clerics, they have absolute power, they have put an end to democracy, and they actually describe themselves as the viceroys of God on earth. Again, going back to early Christianity, it, uh, that the, in the Old Testament and New Testament and the Bible, the Abraham, they have a great deal 
in common, you know, theoretically. So here is the nature of the revolution and inside the country, it's fascinating that in spite of this really, in, in spite of this anti indictment totalitarian revolution, the new generations, to, today, at the time of the revolution, Iran had 35 million people. Today, Iran has 83 million people. 75% of Iranian people are uh, under 50, which means they were not born or they were babies at the time of its 1979 revolution. And yet, what has happened in Iran, very massive and deep anti religious fundamentalism and a move, women's movement in Iran, which is unprecedented in the Islamic world. Even today, in spite of all the repression, all the force the regime has used, Iran, 60% of university students in Iran are women. And for the first time, Iranian women have started a movement that is unprecedented in the Islamic world, life, liberty, and a movement that is not ideological qualitatively different, the kind of the kind of ideas or ideologies that motivated their parents and grandparents against the Shah. And as we all know that it, for one year, they had this fantastic movement in the country led by young Iranian men and women, particularly women. As a result of that, over 500, uh, uh, 500 people were killed on the streets and over 22,000 people were arrested. And the struggle in Iran you know, continues. And you know, there are many other questions with respect to the nature of this regime, but if we really want to understand how it, the possibility of influencing the trend, so long as the clerics are in power, they have been, they had three ways of, uh, of I would say three tools of, running and managing the country. One was oil, the export of oil, which was the major source of income for the religion. The second was religious ideology. The third one, the coercive apparatus. With respect to the oil, because of the sanctions, Iran has been significantly weakened, and also the facilities of Iranian uh, gas and, and oil industries, they need modernization, but because of the sanctions and because of isolation of Iran internationally, the country is not able to do that. And also because of its, its confrontation with the West and most countries, Israel and the West, in that sense, economically, Iran today, the, the culture, the poverty in Iran is greater than ever before. Class division, Iran is more divided in terms of uh, the, the in income than ever before. And yet, the, the, in other words, an ideology has become completely bankrupt, totally bankrupt. That is, the, the, the regime in action, which has only used force to, in order to rule the ideological, religious vocabulary that they used in the beginning, and it was unaffected. It has become completely ineffective. And yet, what they have gained and is helping them today is establishment of a coercive apparatus, the Revolutionary Guards. Over 250,000 people in it. And it's really very much, if I want to find one example in the world to say that, that the Revolutionary Guard is Hitler's Gestapo. In other words, this Tashkilat, is, this organization is created to defend the regime. It has virtually nothing to do with the security of, of the country at large. And they're ready because they have both economic and ideological identity with the regime. You know, they control about 40% of the country's you know, economy. So, so long as the, there is an absolute ruler in Iran and the uh, revolutionary guards remain united it's extremely difficult to challenge, challenge the regime. But the hope is, and there are many indications, there are many, there is evidence that within the revolutionary guards, the divisions and fragmentations, that when Khamenei, the absolute ruler, he's 84 years old, if he, when he passes away, there is hope 
The base star can't get into it because of the details and lack of time, but there is really some evidence that within the revolution, we got particularly the younger people, the raising questions and opposition to the regime, but it is not open, it's not over. And yet it's conceived only after the disintegration or division within the revolutionary guards, it can, it can provide opportunity for the vast majority of Iranian who are opposed to the regime, particularly the young people who are very much, and what has prevented the Iranian regime to control the society ideologically or culturally is the revolution in communication. Every Iranian has the telephone and every, you know, it, it, they're very informed. You know, I think it, Iran is the fifth country in the world in, use, in using uh, the uh, virtual universe and the regime has not been able to contain and suppress that. So I'm personally hopeful that the new generations after Khomeini, Khomeini the absolute leader, is uh, eliminated, that it's, the, there is a possibility of division within the revolution because the possibility of Iran restoring its tradition of, of, of uh, commitment to the idea of, of democracy, commitment to the idea of, of uh, acceptance of civility and, and, and uh, <laughs> Uh, diversity of perspective, which are inevitable, there is hope in Iran for the among the young people, particularly women. The women's movement in Iran is unprecedented in the history of the Islamic world, and that is really the hope that after fall of the absolute leader and fragmentation and division within the revolution regards, Iran could have, in what way it's impossible to predict it, but the hope that this totalitarian anti environment regime can come to an end after the fall of the, the, the uh, death of the absolute leader and the division within the revolutionary guards. I'll, I'll be happy to share my comments in response to your uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much. Professor Frahong, thank you for that. Round of applause. Uh, yeah. We, we appreciate that, the backgrounder, the insight taking us back into the deep history and back to uh, this time. And the demographic here is, I would say people on average are a little over 50 at this point, would you say? All right, if we have, right. we have agreement here. So, 55 of the, 75% of the people in Iran are 50 and under, under 50 years old. Right. So, so we, the democratic get... Iran is extremely, and I should really add here that it's the only the Iran leads the world in brain drain. Over seven million Iranians, overwhelming majority of them professionals and entrepreneurs, have left the country. That's why political activities against the Iranian regime in Europe, in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand are very, very active and unprecedented. So far, so far as I know, as a student of international relations, I never had never known uh, exiles, dissidents outside the country constituting a significant political movement and cooperating with the dissidents inside the country. Be amazing. Time will tell. Let's, we're going to go around for questions here. Your name and uh, your question, please. Uh, Jeff. Um, I'm interested in the religious roots of the uh, anti-Semitism towards Israel, towards Jews in general, uh, where that comes from uh, in Islam. Uh, and I wanted to know your take, secondly, of what you think. Uh, well, you mentioned Hitler's Gestapo wiping out uh, resistance. But Hitler was also trying to to uh, destroy a people, the Jews. Um, where does that come from in the religion? And second, first of all, uh, Islam is uh, anti-Semitism is not as strong in Islam. There is definitely anti-Semitism, no question. When you read the world, and I would say anti-Semitism in Christianity has always been stronger than in Islam. 
in Iran, they are using, it's not so much anti-Semitic, they are anti-Semitic, just there is no question about that, the, the, the clerical leaders. But Iran, at, uh, Jews in Iran, uh, had uh, they were very much integrated into the society before the revolution. And there was really no anti-Semitism in Iran before the revolution. What, the, what the, the, the theocracy in Iran is doing is actually using Israel, opposition to Israel has become a tool and an instrument of appealing to the Arab masses or the called Arab street, because there is definitely resentment toward Israel in Arab street, uh, whether it has partly anti-Semitism and partly with respect to identity with the Palestinians. So Iranian definitely today is behaving the Iranian regime as an anti-Semitic regime, but I can tell you without any question that overwhelming majority of Iranian people are opposed to that idea. And in fact, Iranian Jews are in many ways more Persian than the Persian. They have been in Iran as we go from before Christianity. So the uh, the anti-Semitism in 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 Islam, we could find the same roots as we find in in Christianity. But today, the Islamic regime specifically is using anti-Semitism and anti-Israel as a way, as an instrument and tool of its expansionist territorial expansionist ideas in the Middle East region. For example, the Hamas. Uh, uh, and Hezbollah, they received a great deal of money, military assistance, economic assistance. In fact, Iran, the Iranian leaders know that these people are not able to defeat Israel, but they are used in order to promote the ideology, the, the radical anti enlightenment ideology of the Iranian regime. In other words, if we really want to understand the animosity of the Iranian regime toward Israel, we have to look for political motives more than religious motives. Thank you. Other questions? They'll come around here. Hi, I'm curious uh, what your recommendation would be for American foreign policy towards Iran today. American foreign policy toward Iran, just to support to what, what identify with, with with the liberal in Iran today, there is definitely a, a democratic movement. A democratic movement cannot be organized. But when we look at literature, when we look at the activities of the the number of political prisoners in the country, the United States must uh, uh, support the this progressive democratic movement in Iran. But the United States has a dilemma. As that dilemma we have to understand. Iran is pursuing a, 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 the idea of gaining the capacity to make nuclear weapons. And technologically, the country has, it, the, that technology is started under the Shah. And in the beginning, the Iranian regime opposed that. But later on, particularly during the Iran Iraq war, they decided to revive the nuclear program. And now they're enriching uranium up to 60%. And potentially, according to international uh, experts, Iran has the capacity to make nuclear weapons. Therefore, it is in the interest of the United States and in the interest of Europe to contain Iranian nuclear program. So if, if there are two ways to do that, one is diplomacy, the other one is forced. At the present time, I don't think the United States or European countries are in the position of invading Iran militarily because it could lead to civil war, a regional war, and the de devastation that the Iranians will suffer from it. And after Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Libya and so forth, even there is public opinion in the United States is very much against in, uh, military interference. So the United States, on the one hand, they have to oppose the regime. They have to, to support the progressive people in Iran. On the other hand, they have to be open to negotiation because if Iran gains the capacity to make nuclear weapons, we can be certain that Turkey uh, and Egypt and Saudi Arabia also want to have, because they all have signed 
uh, the, uh, the, the nuclear proliferation, anti-proliferation treaty. But that set to the anti-proliferation treaty is extremely important, not only to the United States and European countries, but also to Russia and China. Russia and China cooperated with the United States during the Obama administration, and they passed six resolutions against Iran. And in fact, they defined Iran according to chapter seven of the UN Charter that Iran is a threat to international peace and security, and they worked together. And it was a mistake for Trump to withdraw from uh, the nuclear deal. Not because by doing that, they opened the space for Iranians to continue uh, the enrichment of uranium and expand actually their technology. So for the United States and the European countries facing Iran, they have a dilemma. On the one hand, it is in the in the national, in the security and economic interest, and it actually in the interests of, of a non-proliferation treaty to engage Iran in, dip, in uh, diplomatic uh, negotiation. On the other hand, the nature, fascistic nature of the regime, the totalitarian nature of the regime is very much opposed to everything the United States and Western Europe stand for. So if we have to appreciate the dilemma. Hope is that with the, after Ali Khamenei, the, the, the absolute ruler of Iran, after his death, a situation will arise that either diplomacy or greater force and isolation of Iran could deal with Iran's nuclear program. But right now, the West is actually faced with a dilemma that there is no easy answer to resolve it. Pleasure to learn from an expert, isn't it? Tom, next question. Hi, my name is Tom. I, I have a question. And as you said that Khomeini, uh, you know, when he dies, the political situation you think is gonna pro might change. My question is, what is your best guess what the political situation or the policies of the government are going to be one year, five years, and 10 years from now, mainly towards democracy, towards women's rights, towards a hijab, and uh, views like that, more towards the people themselves, and maybe towards anti-Americanism. Where, where would you say your best guess for one, five, and 10 years from today would be? I would say if I go to... in between five to 10 years. Iran, first of all, it's fascinating to know that Iran in the Middle East is probably the most pro-American society in the Middle East and North Africa. It's a fact. It's really the overwhelming majority of the Iranian intellectuals and writers who all participated in the revolution, thinking that they were establishing some kind of democratic open society. They live in Europe and in the United States you know, today, as well as in in Canada. And particularly what is interesting in Iran, in the past, the leftist used, the, the, the leftist played a very self-destructive role by assisting their theory, their ideas, it, it, it had convinced them that the clerics, religious people cannot establish a state. So we have to use the religious people against the liberals and the social democratic people once we do that, then we would be able to overcome the challenge from the religious people. There was obviously the mistake. What the, what the Khomeini and other religious leaders, they used the leftist, the Marxist, Leninist, particularly the Tudor Party, which was a tool of the Soviet Union at the time. They used it against the liberals and progressive forces. And once it happened, they decimated the communist in Iran. Today, there is no ideology in Iran. In other words, when we see when uh, this slogan, which is really a fascinating slogan coming from, from Iran, that uh, uh, that life, liberty, and woman, it's, uh, I would say, the, it's within the clerical establishment. There are many people who are speaking out leaving the country and openly speaking and ending up in jail, saying that what this religion has done against religion, against the religious sensibilities and religious beliefs of the people, it has, 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 is unprecedented in any Islamic society. And that's really true. That's, so there is opposition from the religious community, and they say religious community should not get involved in power. In other words, I have seen many of them 
coding American constitution, coding American founding fathers, that there is no official religion in the country. It's fascinating that it's becoming, instead of attacking American imperialism these days, we see references, discussion, analysis of the fact in the United States, there is no official religion, which was the very first time in the a revolution that whatever limitations it had with respect to gender equality or with respect to uh, slavery, but religion, the country did not have an official religion. So in that sense, uh, the mindset, the sensibilities, the ideas, the literature appealing to the young people in Iran and two generations, and as I've said before, 75% of the people representing post-revolutionary generations. I'm personally very hope it's impossible to predict the future in terms of details, but I'm personally hopeful and optimistic that within five to 10 years, Iran will become an open, even democratic society. It, it, the first step, it doesn't become Switzerland overnight, or doesn't become the United States overnight. But I think there is great deal of potential activism in Iran, that Iran will be, we don't have a single, Israel is the only democratic state in the, in the Middle East. And even there, because of the Palestinians, the, the question of democracy has all kinds of challenges to be faced. But for the Israeli citizens inside the country, even for the Muslim inside the country, there is democratic freedom. There is open, the only country. We don't have a democratic society. Hope It was hoped that Turkey will establish the first Islamic democracy in the region. Unfortunately, even Turkey seems to be moving in the wrong direction. So I'm, I personally hope and I'm optimistic that the Iran will be in five to 10 years, uh, a, a, a country which is nominally you know, Islamic and most people would probably have the religious values and, and beliefs in the in a non-ideological way. But I'm very hopeful that Iran will be a democratic country in five to 10 years. This is why it's so helpful to learn from experts. Who would have thought this view from the inside about how things continue to shift? Many- very... uh, Go ahead, please. But book, uh, uh, writers, you know, Poets, writers, musicians, uh, just over for one year, as I ended up explaining, universities, you see, what they have done to the university, they have put an end to secularization of education, secularization of the judiciary. So there's opposition even from within the religious community, opposition to these you know, policies. But they're actually... Uh, uh, both inside and outside the country, there is no limit to essays and books published uh, with respect to both criticism of the existing regime and hope or optimism with respect to the m movement away from movement toward a democratic society. I'm personally optimistic and hopeful. Professor, here's your next question. Hello, thank you very much. I really appreciate your comments. My name is Ellen. Um, what is your perspective on the role of the sanctions that the US and other others have imposed on Iran? It's obviously hurt them economically and it hurts the people. Is there still a role for sanctions in foreign policy? You see, the sanctions have never really uh led to the only place where the sanctions seem to have worked was South Africa, historically. There are many people. However, sa sanctions has to be purposed with sanctions with respect to military or any kind of technologies that expands the power of the state, absolutely necessary. But to the extent that sanctions are going to limit economic activities, people will suffer because even there's it in the rentier state. Iran is a rentier state. The major source of income for the state is from oil export, gas and oil export. And there is a huge uh, 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 market 
as we all know, not only open market, but also secret uh, the, the organizations. So Iran has been able to, even though Iranian oil has been uh, sanctioned, but last year they had over $100 billion worth of arms, uh, uh, oil and gas export. So I'm not really an economist, I cannot give you details, but the sanctions to the extent that it has to do with power of the government, they're absolutely necessary, but to the extent that sanctions could limit the business people, the private sector of the economy, people will suffer because people who are associated with the government, they won't suffer economically, but the ordinary people do. And many people have written a great deal, but in what sense the sanctions is necessary has to be continued and in what areas sanctions have, with, for, for example, with respect to food, medicine, some humanitarian activities. It, it, people are suffering from sanctions in Iran uh, and you know, Hope is that if Iran, the United States is going to use diplomacy in order to contain, in order to limit Iran's nuclear program, could that could also be used that when it when it comes to uh, the private economic activities, uh, sanctions is not used as a tool to uh, pressure Iran. But I. But there are many economists have written about these things in details. I'm not really informed about that. We have about 15 minutes left and a few more questions. Vito? Yeah. yeah, my name is Vito. The, uh, would it, this has been fascinating. Uh, would, would I be correct in understanding you to say that the hope for change in Iran will not come from the United States or from external forces, uh, but will come from the demographics and come from, from the changing population, will come from the uh, the uh, diaspora population, from the intelligentsia, will be internal change rather than imposed from the outside. Would that Absolutely. be a correct understanding? Absolutely. It's not only really, as a very gendered proposition. The United States has unprecedented destructive power, as we saw in Iraq, as we saw in Afghanistan, as we saw in Vietnam. But when it comes to construction, it has to come from within the society. It has to come from uh, what Iran needs is uh, a kind of coalition building. And the reason that the religious radicals could win because they had one uncontested leader and they followed him. When it came to secularists, they were fragmented. They were atomized. Today, because ideology doesn't play a role, in the opposition to the regime, in his commitment to the idea of democratic values, the hope that the coalition necessary in order to challenge the present regime after intel, we have to understand that these autocratic regimes have to be weakened and fragmented from within in order to challenge against them be successful. It was exactly like the Shah. You know, as soon as the Shah was challenged, all the elite began to leave the country. And he really didn't have any popular base. The same thing is happening to the present regime. You're absolutely right. It's the idea of interference from without when it comes to construction is useless. It never works as, as it didn't work in Vietnam or in Afghanistan or in, in, in Iraq and elsewhere. But uh, cons the destruction, what the United States did to Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of its destructive power, it was incredible. Iran wants the United States to support the idea of democracy, wants to support the movement, even in, in uh, the diplomatic in the United Nations, in international organizations, in the media. The support for the idea of democracy in Iran can be inspiring for the activists inside the country, but the activists inside the country are categorically opposed to the idea of foreign military interference in the country, because that will serve the radical, that will serve the anti-democratic anti forces, as it did in Afghanistan and Iraq. Here's your next question from John. John? <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so a quick question. Uh, I certainly hope the one five-year plan that you indicated comes to pass. But the question I ask is this. 
if Iran becomes a nuclear power, do you believe that Khomeini, if it's within his lifetime, will take the step to try and return Israel to Arab lands by using nuclear power? I have I believe that if Iran, if the Iran's potential to make nuclear weapons gets close to be actual military force against Iran by Israel and the United States, is virtually inevitable. So I cannot imagine Iran becoming a country with nuclear weapons. But how to how it will stop? I hope that diplomacy will do it because using force against the Iran, the United States can destroy nuclear facilities, all the nuclear facilities, economic facilities, industrial facilities, Israel and the United States can easily do that. But that will strengthen the regime against its own people. It, that will the autocratic, the Gestapo nature against the Iranian people will not change. There will be war against the against certain institutions and certain capabilities of the regime. It's so I I don't think Israel could tolerate or the United States or even Western European countries. And even if you ask me, even Russia and China, Russia and Ch particularly China has economic relations with every country in the with Israel, with Saudi Arabia, with Jordan, with all the, uh, the Arab states of the Persian Gulf. They absolutely do not want a nuclear rivalry in the region. That's why they all voted against you know, Iran. So I don't see Iran becoming a nuclear weapon state, but I'm hoping that diplomacy will prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapon state. Otherwise, there will be a war, and the war will be devastating to the people in the region, as well as Iranian people in general. And and, and the Iranians know that. They're using, right now, they're using the nuclear enrichment of uranium and advancement in order to get concessions from the United States with respect to sanctions. And it might, you know, Biden, the present situation, Iran's assistance to Hamas, which is another fascist organization, or Islamic Jihad, these, these organizations have become anti-Semitic, and fascistic. They are not interested. Regrettably, the present government of Israel has never been able to negotiate with Palestinian Israel. In, in the, it's the, 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 the irony, the, the pathological nature of, the, of politics in the region, when we go to the United Nations, there are only two states that are opposed to negotiation between Palestinians and Israelis. One is Iran, the other one is uh, Netanyahu's coalition government. It's incredible. The best, the only way, in fact, the most effective way to eliminate fascistic groups like Hamas, like Islamic Jihad, or like the Iranian clerical government is to negotiate with the Palestinians who recognize the legitimacy of Israel and who oppose violence. And Mahmoud Abbas, the, he doesn't have any power because of of the violence and refusal of, of Netanyahu to negotiate with him. For 50 years, he has opposed the use of violence. For 50 years, he has accepted the legitimacy of the state of Israel. But the right-wing people in Israel who seem to have really the real influential power in the government, they're opposed to the idea of negotiation. They opened the Old Testament. I was in Israel, and when we went to one of these uh, uh, settler groups, a colleague, we were, we were about 15 ac ac academics from American universities, one of them asked, what is your uh, solution to the problem of Palestine? He, took the, uh, the Old Testament out of his pocket, and he said, the biblical land of Israel is from Nile to Euphrates. And they don't recognize. The vast majority of Israelis want peace, want negotiation, but they don't really, when it comes to political power, they have not been able, and largely due to the threat they face from outside. So the, the best way to fight Iran 
to put an end to Hamas and the rest is to start negotiation between Israel and Palestinian Authority headed by Mahmoud Abbas or other Palestinians who have demonstrated in their action, in their behavior, in their ideas that they, they respect the legitimacy and the democracy of Israel and they want to engage in negotiation. Unfortunately, Netanyahu is opposed to the idea and some of the people he has included in his cabinet, as we saw in the year of demonstration by Israeli pro-negotiation and pro-peace activists, it continues. Hope is that the present tragedy can change the government of Israel, that we have, we have a more a coalition government interested and active in negotiating with Palestinians. After the death of Esau Rabin, the man who signed with Yasser Arafat, they signed the Oslo Accord. Then they started negotiating and there was hope that they would solve the problem peacefully when Esau Rabin was assassinated. By who? By a radical uh, Israeli who categorically rejected the idea and he has supporters. So the hope to defeat Iran and other Arab radicals against Israel is negotiation with pro-peace and, and, uh, and people who want to coexist with Israel. And that's really the otherwise, the tragedy that you are witnessing today has no end unless there is a negotiation between Israel and uh, pro-democracy Palestinians. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Tom. I, I want to uh, ask you a question about the role of Islam, not only in terms of theology, but in terms of uh, a government practice. And I'm looking at not only at Iran, but also in Erdogan in Turkey and the Muslim Brotherhood. And do you see the ability of democracy to um, become part of that uh, theological frame of mind, or will it take some kind of change? It will take change. There is no way. So the moment you begin to present religion as they did in Iran during the 1960s, and turn it into an ideology. It is absolute. Islam does not recognize plurality of perspectives in the society. In any open society, across the board, even the most democratic societies that the four you know, democracy has four unwritten assumptions that when in any society where people are faced with challenges with, with uh, the issues that concern them all they have they have conflict that they have diversity of interest the, uh, the conflict of interest they have conflict of ideas they have conflict of style they have a uh, clash of personalities. Democracy is the only way to deal with that. Islam doesn't permit that. And I would say any religion that becomes an ideology doesn't permit that. Just as for a minority of people, Judaism has become a political ideology. I was in Israel even on sad on people, some of the radical people who for example, want the rest of the society to subscribe to uh, their normal, regular practices it, it, instead of leaving it to individual choice, they do it collective. We saw it in Christianity, it, Islam is worse because Islam, unlike uh, Christianity and Judaism, from its inception, it was a political movement. From its inception, it was a totalitarian movement. It never accepted diversity. And in, in Egypt, in Iran, and unfortunately Erdogan in doing it, as before existed, the, the, the Ottomans were they controlled Turkey. Wherever religion becomes an ideology, it becomes totalitarian, it becomes categorically opposed to the idea of diversity, the diversity of perspectives and individual free. And when that happens, democracy is out. So religion has to become completely apolitical. It has to be a choice of individual human beings to choose it or not to choose it. That's really the precondition for democratic development. And I genuinely believe that it has happened in Iran, potentially. And this potential has great chance to become actualized in the coming years. 
Professor, this has been excellent. We thank you for your time. Uh, unfortunately, we have to be out of this room fairly shortly. There's going to be another session going on. But if we could give the, the professor a round of applause again. We, we have had, thanks to Rebecca, a number of world-class speakers here. Uh, you're clearly among the best, so we appreciate that. Thank Hopefully you so much. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure chatting. Good. Likewise. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Good day. Thank you.